Superior Court of Fulton County Elect, the Gentleman Circuit is now in session. The Honorable Judge Scott McAfee is presiding. The court will now come Thank to order. You. Please be seated. We are back on the record with 23 SC 188947, uh, beginning with the state. If I can have counsel for today identify themselves for the record. I don't know if I can say All right. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Steve Sadow, Jennifer Little for President Trump. All right. He's actually down in Florida. Understood. Thank you, Mr. Sadow. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Richard Rice and Chris and Lewitz for Mr. Cheeley and Mr. Cheeley Williams. Right, on behalf of Mr. Giuliani. Alan Stockton, on behalf of Mayor Giuliani, Vice President. Thank you. On behalf of Mr. Meadows. Your Honor, Jim Durham, on behalf of Mr. Meadows, he waives his appearance. On behalf of Mr. Clark. Harry McDougall, Your Honor, Mr. Clark waives his appearance. On behalf of Mr. Roman. Good morning, Judge. Ashley Merchant and John Merchant on behalf of Mr. Roman, and he waves his hand. On behalf of Mr. Schaefer. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, Craig Gillen, Anthony Lake, and Holly Pearson on behalf of David Schaefer, and he waves his presence. On behalf of Mr. Floyd. Do we have anyone joining us on Zoom on behalf of Mr. Floyd? All right. Well, seeing as uh, counsel had previously attended the prior hearings and this one has been noticed, I'll find that they've waived their appearance for argument today. Uh, anyone on behalf of Ms. Latham? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Bill Cromwell on behalf of Ms. Latham. She waits for president. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cromwell. All right. So I have been informed by uh, counsel collectively for the defendants that they were requesting a total of an hour and a half for argument to be divided amongst themselves with them, as they've already agreed. And so to effectuate that, I have, I'll have the uh, time uh, queued up and we'll start the clock running and you all can see fit to divide that as you uh, would like and obviously have allowed uh, the same amount of time for the state as well uh, before we get into that i believe there may have been a few things just to uh, clean up as part of the record uh, specifically since we last convened uh, counsel on behalf of mr roman had submitted a defense exhibit 39 and uh, if there are any ob objections that wanted to be placed on the record on behalf of the state, we can do that now. Uh, but at a minimum, I think the intention was that I would be admitting that uh, collectively uh, as an exhibit, if nothing else, just for uh, appellate purposes for the record. Mr. Abadi, anything the state wants to add as it relates to Exhibit 39? No objection from the state. I have a copy for the court reporter. I printed a copy out and then I sent it to All right. If you've got that marked and stand, we'll provide that to the court reporter. And then, as I indicated as well on Tuesday, both parties since the uh, close of the day evidence on the 16th had followed up. Uh, now I think both sides have made requests to reopen the evidence. On behalf of the defense, there were some issues with uh, cell phone records, and the state has uh, found an additional uh, witness that they would like to present. And the instruction I provided on Tuesday was that for today, I think we've reached the point where I'd like to hear more of how some of the legal arguments apply to what has already been presented. And it may already be possible for me to make a decision uh, without those needing to be material uh, to that decision. So that's why we're here today. I wanted to make sure we held this time because it is a bit of a logistical challenge to get everyone in a room together. Uh, so, but recognizing that, um, again, in the interest of efficiency, if both parties want to reserve part of their time to argue as if those proffered uh, exhibits have been admitted, Feel free to make whatever arguments you, you would like. And if, in fact, it turns out that I do need those to be part of the record to make a decision, then we'd have to come back and we will do those in accordance with the rules of evidence. Mr. Gilmer. We have a, and we have not filed anything, but we also have a proper witness that we would like to call in the event the court does open the evidence up. I can make an oral proffer as to who that witness is and what that witness would be saying and I could do it, and I think in a fairly brief manner, uh, if the court would permit me, so the court would understand where I'm coming from. And I believe also Mr. Cromwell uh, also has a uh, brief proffer uh, for a witness that he has uh, has has uh, talked with and does have an oral proffer. So, so are these 
we've got this is the first I've heard of it. So are these things that have been discussed or shared with the state at all? No, Your Honor. I literally uh, my communication with this particular witness occurred uh, this morning at about uh, ten ten, uh, along with Mr. Uh, Chris and Noah was on the call with me. I'm more than happy to to enlighten the court as to uh, what the witness would say, who the witness is, and you know, in a brief brief summary of what uh, this particular witness would testify to in the event the court allows for evidence to be reopened. And on the record, I would state that on behalf of my client, Mr. Schaefer, we do want the record to be reopened so that the court could hear what they, if they want to bring in someone from California, let them bring them in. And we believe that the court uh, might want it to hear the proffer and the evidence that we are uh, prepared to at least proffer today. All right. So, Mr. Gill, on that point to, to this and Mr. Cromwell's, you know, even, uh, additional evidence, in my mind, uh, in the interest of a fair notice to the other side, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want that to be part of the argument today because the state has no idea what you're about to say. And I think the, the, the purpose of a proffer, in large part in this role, and in this context, is having them at least have the ability to make those initial counter arguments. Now, um, I don't think that would prevent you from, after today's hearing, if you want to file it, make it part of the record, then I think that both parties have already elected that they are willing to use that mechanism. Uh, but just for today, um, kind of showing up now without having shown this uh, other side at all, even this morning, uh, I don't think that would be fair. I do not intend to use the proffer in the legal argument. Sure. I just wanted the court to be aware that we do have an oral proffer. We can file it, we can supplement the record and file it uh, for the court's consideration. But literally, right. hot off the press. Sure. As we uh, printed it out and wrote down uh, to the court. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Crown, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Abadi, anything you want to add to that? I, I don't know what it is, so I don't know how to add to it. Oh, no. All right. Just anything, on, though, on a procedural perspective? I mean, from a procedural perspective, I would uh, submit to the court, as you said multiple times, evidence is closed. Um, this is uh, beyond the scope of, uh, I guess, Your Honor's uh, ruling on uh, Tuesday. It feels like it was three weeks ago, but Tuesday. So um, I guess we'd object at this point and go from there. Okay. All right. Anything else by way of housekeeping, Very Mr. Sato? Uh, apparently the state filed two supplemental exhibits, <coughs> number two and number three, about 15 minutes ago. So to the extent that they can convert and use those in their proffer, talking about the same notice requirement, we actually did just got it as well. Understood. So, as it relates to that, Your Honor, um, I believe you were very clear on Tuesday as well that in the proffers we could argue rebuttal evidence as it relates to the uh, evidence that was submitted by defense counsel after the evidence was closed. And that's merely what it is, is rebuttal evidence as it relates to the cell phone records or analysis um, that was done by the non-expert um, filed by Mr. Seda. All right. Mr. Kelly. Well, when, uh, as it relates to the, to the proffered evidence, our proffered evidence would be in direct rebuttal to testimony given um, uh, in the courtroom, particularly by Mr. Bradley. So we would have a direct rebuttal of that. That's what our proffer will be. I understand the court's ruling. Just want to uh, put that on the okay. record. Just so we know the context of it. Is that similar for Mr. Cromwell as well? It is. And just solely relates to Mr. Bradley's testimony? It does. Okay. All right. All right, noted. Anything else then? Your Honor, the, the proffered evidence is basically would corroborate what has uh, been admitted in evidence as Exhibit 39, but in chronological text. Okay. All right. Uh, then if there is nothing else, I'll turn it over uh, to Ms. Merchant to begin on behalf of the defense. Sorry, Judge. Unfortunately, you're okay. stuck with me today. Understood. Please the court, Your Honor, uh, John Merchant on behalf of Mr. Roman. 
just by way of roadmap uh, to give you some idea about the allocation of time and what I'm going to be covering. Uh, uh, I've been charged with talking to Your Honor about the conflict issue and the appearance of a conflict uh, and what we believe the evidence to show on that issue. Uh, Mr. Sadow, um, Mr. Gillum will be talking more about the forensic misconduct piece of it, uh, Ms. Willis's church speech, uh, statements made to the media, uh, fraud on the court, frankly, and um, the book that she gave several interviews for. Um, so I won't be discussing any of those issues. So if, you, if you'd like to ask me, certainly I can try to address them, but that's, that's going to be the focus of their uh, presentation. And then uh, towards the end, other folks uh, may have some uh, issue-specific type arguments, uh, either in follow-up to mine or the forensic misconduct. But those are the two lanes um, that we're going to be covering, but I'm going to do the conflict piece of it for you. And on that issue, uh, Your Honor, um, this is a matter of first impression uh, in Georgia. Uh, I can't find a single case uh, that's been published um, by the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court that is based on these facts. Um, there are, of course, a number of different uh, appellate court cases that deal with conflict-related issues and, more importantly, appearance of conflict-related issues. And uh, some of those are based in state law. Some of them are based on the ethical rules that govern lawyers. Um, some of them are based on the Sixth Amendment right. Uh, to due process that's implicit in all of what we're doing here today. I want to remind the court that we're here today on this motion to disqualify uh, D.A. Willis and her office because uh, of her judgment, um, frankly. Uh, she is supposed to be disinterested under the Sixth Amendment, and she's anything but that. Uh, the fact that these proceedings have taken this long uh, and through, through the convoluted way we've, we've made it here today it, explain that. Um, so. As I present my arguments, I want the court to understand that this court uh, represents the guardrails for the Sixth Amendment in this context, and Ms. Willis has already been disqualified once. So I, I would encourage the court to uh, remember what Judge McBurney did uh, in his order disqualifying. Um, the, the same argument was made in that case as to whether or not there needs to be an actual uh, conflict of interest or whether or not the appearance of a conflict of interest uh, might uh, be sufficient uh, under the facts. I want to make clear to the court that I, I pr the law in Georgia suggests and is very clear that we can demonstrate an appearance of a conflict of interest and that is sufficient. Uh, there, are, there is, I'm going to be candid with the court, there is a Supreme Court decision from 1996, Lambie State, and then there are two Court of Appeal decisions after that that deal uh, it, and frankly, in some dicta that suggests that an actual conflict um, is required. But this, the Supreme Court of Georgia, since those decisions uh, came down, has made quite clear that the appearance of the conflict standard still applies. And the reason that's important is I think under the Sixth Amendment, which is where we're, we're at, um, in order to preserve the defendant's um, rights under that uh, under that provision and under corollary provisions of Georgia law, you've got, you've got to consider the appearance of a conflict. And the reason why the appearance of a conflict is so prescient here um, is because if, if this court allows um, this kind of behavior uh, to go on um, in, and allows DAs across the state um, by its order to um, engage in these kinds of activities, the entire uh, public confidence in the system will be shot. Um, and the integrity of the system will be undermined. Uh, and so with those sort of public policy and constitutional principles, um, I wanted to turn uh, to the law in Georgia on disqualification. And, Your Honor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the law, and then I'm going to talk about the facts and how they apply to the law at the end. If you want to talk about the facts earlier, jump right in, and I'll, I'll be happy to do that. I'm sure Your Honor is very well prepared and probably knows uh, all the law that I'm going to cite to you. But uh, to give the, the skeleton outline, um, the, the original uh, seminal case that deals with conflict of interest uh, from the Georgia Supreme Court is Williams v. State. That's 258 Georgia 305. And there are basically two methods by which you can disqualify um, a district attorney. One of them is a conflict of interest, and I'll suggest the, to the court that doesn't mean an actual conflict. That could mean an appearance of conflict as well, and then forensic misconduct. Um, importantly, in the Williams case, though, in footnote four, and I think this is important for the court's analysis about the facts and where they, which box it fits into, the court said there is no clear demarcation line between conflict of interest and forensic misconduct, and given a given ground for disqualification of the prosecutor might be classifiable as either. And I think that's important because we have facts that fit in both boxes. So if a state stands up and says, well, there's no actual conflict here, Judge, that doesn't mean necessarily that it doesn't apply to the forensic misconduct. Um, typically, forensic misconduct relates to statements of the prosecutor uh, designed to uh, impugn the character of the defendant before trial. 
uh, and to affect the jury pool, uh, which we have here, which I'm not going to discuss, but the, the facts that we have here very much relate um, to that issue, and, they, and there's crossover. Um, importantly, um, and I think this is important for the court's consideration of what, what effect the court's ruling may have, um, it is if, if you deny this motion, there's a good chance, if it's reversed, that, we're, that we would be granted a new trial. So that means we're going to have to do this all over again. Um, in uh, amusement sales uh, versus state, 316 Georgia Appellate 727, um, that's a case that cites Whitworth, which is physical precedent only. Um, the court said, if the assigned prosecutor has acquired a personal interest or stake in the conviction, the trial court abuses its discretion in denying a motion to disqualify him, and the defendant is entitled to a new trial, new trial even without a showing of prejudice. So that means if, if, if we show the court today, and I think we have uh, through the proceedings uh, today and before, that Ms. Willis has developed a very personal interest in this case, and Your Honor denies this motion, uh, we're coming back all over again if the appellate court say, say we, you were wrong. So what, um, what is that personal interest? So the, so the personal interest can be, there's, there's no definition of that under George law. And it, it could be a personal financial interest. It could be a personal interest related to uh, bias against a particular defendant, which f sort of falls into the forensic misconduct box. Uh, but we have here a very personal financial interest that's been laid out uh, in terms of uh, money received by Ms. Willis as a result of the, the scheme that she set up. Um, and um, but to, to get to the issue of the, of the personal interest in the context of an appearance, I think that's important. I do want to uh, suggest to the court that there are a number of cases um, that uh, post-date uh, this actual conflict of interest language um, that's suggested in some of the cases from the 90s. Uh, that, that you have to pay attention to what this looks like to the public. Um, and I, I agree with uh, all of the law, and I'm sure the state's going to stand up here and say it can't be a speculative uh, or a conjectural um, type of uh, personal interest. Uh, we don't have that here. We have something very concrete. And as, as Judge McBurney put it, um, actual and palpable, not speculative and remote. That's exactly what we have here. We've demonstrated through the testimony of the witnesses, uh, some of whom impeached themselves, uh, that we have a very personal interest. Um, in uh, the, 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 the seminal um, United States court case that deals with um, pr prosecutorial impropriety um, is Young v. U.S. Uh, that's a 41 U.S. 787 case. In that case, it's the opportunity for conflicts to arise that created at least the appearance of impropriety. And that's the case that requires that the prosecutor be disinterested. Since a scheme injecting a personal interest, financial or otherwise, into the enforcement process may bring irrelevant and impermissible factors into the prosecutorial decision. Now, there are a number of Georgia cases that sort of repeat that theme. Uh, Reeves v. State, 231, Georgia Appellate 22, that's a 1998 case, stated a potential conflict of interest existed in the appearance of impropriety existed. Um, Davenport v. State, 157, Georgia Appellate 704, that's a 1981 case. That was decided seven years before Williams. When there is at least the appearance of impropriety, a defendant is denied fundam fundamental fairness in the state's prosecution of the charges against him or her. There are also rules that govern um, prosecutors. Um, lawyers, in, in general, are bound to preserve and avoid even the appearance of impropriety. That's Brown v. State, 256, Georgia Appellate, uh, 603, 202, uh, 2002. Head v. State, um, a prosecutor's close personal relationship with the victim in a case may create at least the appearance of a prosecution unfairly based on private interest rather than one properly based on vindication of public interest. Uh, uh, ABA criminal justice standards for the prosecution function standard 3.3-1.2c. Uh, a prosecutor should avoid appearance of impropriety in performing the prosecution function. 3-1.7f. The prosecutor should not permit the prosecutor's professional judgment or obligations to be affected by the prosecutor's personal political, financial, professional, business, property, or other interests or relationships. So the rules that govern her in her own profession say that this is wrong because she's developed a financial interest in this case. And at the very least, uh, created the appearance of unfairness towards these defendants by setting up a relationship, uh, a, a, a prosecutorial relationship with her boyfriend. 
um, that she'd been dating for two years, according to the testimony. So before I move, um, Your Honor, to the to the specific facts, I, 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 you asked, you know, what's personal interest, and I think, frankly, um, as I was trying to figure this out, I think you know it when you see it. It's just like um, in the concurrence in uh, Jacobellis versus State of Ohio Supreme Court case from 1964, Justice Stewart, in, in his concurrent opinion, said, "I know it when I see it." Talking about obscenity, I think you know it when you see it. I think I think there's uh, enough facts in front of you um, that you you know it when you see it. And, um, I, I, so I think that that, that the governing principle um, helps enlighten uh, some of the facts here. Um, and also, I think it's not just financial. In McLaughlin v. State, I think the court's very familiar with that case, 295 Georgia 609, uh, 2014. The Supreme Court essentially said that because the, the acting DA had become a witness in the case and developed a personal uh, interest in the case due to the, his daughter's relationship, uh, with the victim um, that he was disqualified uh, and, and not and because he was disqualified his entire office was disqualified um, so turning to the facts of the case your honor um, I think I've got my, my role is 20 minutes so I've got about eight minutes left um, so why why the relationship why did we spend so much time on a relationship um, between these two people we frankly couldn't care less if they had a personal relationship outside of work that, that is not what the issue is here. The issue is that they began this relationship in 2019, they were dating for two years, and then she awarded him a contract where public money, either from Fulton County or the state of Georgia, ended up in his pockets. That decision alone was improper. But what's even, what's even more improper is that then she, she and he used that money to go on personal vacations and trips. Um, if Your Honor will re remember, Exhibits 9, 11, and 12 dealt with the expenditures um, by Wade um, on trips. Um, if, you, if you do the math on that, if you look at what, what he spent, and then you look at the testimony about what was paid back um, by Willis, because the, the cash reimbursement theory, well, I'll talk about in a second, but it, he, if you, if you do the math on what he actually paid for and, and what they testified she paid back in cash, you still have uh, over $9,200, $9,247 $9, to be exact, is, is the amount of money they cannot account for in their testimony. And as Your Honor will remember, um, there was no mention of cash in Mr. Wade's affidavit when uh, the best and first opportunity to, to raise that issue would have come up is when the state filed their response in his affidavit. That is nowhere to be found in there. The first time we heard about cash um, was here in this courtroom. Uh, and so I think um, she had a, so she's received a personal financial benefit of over $9,200 in this case that she can't account for and the state can't account for. And the reason we can't account for it is because they, they came up with a cash theory. Cash theory only only raises. Before we get into that, let me ask you this. Um, let's say they couldn't have. Let's say the theory wasn't even there that they had paid it back or that there had been any exchange. Is should there first be a consideration of a materiality requirement? No. Have you seen not. that in this jurisdiction? Or any, well, not in, it's not in this jurisdiction. Have you seen that in any other jurisdiction? I haven't seen that, Judge. And if it was six dollars, that would still be improper. Would it be improper where it's a per se disqualification if someone you know buys their boss a stick of gum? Is that per se disqualifying because there's no materiality requirement? It, it, well, no, I, I, I don't it, don't disagree that it may not meet a materiality requirement, but it's a personal benefit. I won't say that giving a pack of gum is is just justification for disqualifying a district attorney. I think that's part of the issue, Judge. I think it's a fact based inquiry by you. So there's a continuum involved here. Yeah, I, I, but I think I think the continuum involves you looking at w whether or not um, on the grand scheme in the grand scheme of things it violates the Constitution and whether or not what, what, there's an appearance uh, of a conflict and, and the, the appearance suggests that she actually received a benefit and we know that she did they admitted it. We don't have to speculate about that. They said that they she said she got a benefit and she said she paid back certain amounts. It, it, so it, in that regard, Your Honor, I don't know, would $100 be enough? Would $200 be enough? I think you have to look at it um, globally and, and consider all of the witnesses, consider all of the facts, consider consider the credibility of the witnesses, frankly. Right. I mean, Your Honor sat here and watched everybody, so I haven't spent a lot of time going into the specific testimony because Your Honor is well aware of it. But you get to evaluate the credibility of the witnesses as a fact finder. And um, 
you know, just, just, just you, from a legal perspective, though, you're saying we can't just say dollar amount, look no further. There has to be a totality of the circumstances analysis. I think I think it's fact specific, Judge. I, I don't really want you to pin me down on that because I, there's no law on it. I can't give you a straight answer because I haven't seen anything like that. I don't, and I think if we build a materiality requirement um, into the into the case law, then you're down you're down a slippery slope then because then then it's going to be very the, the appellate courts are going to be deciding well is fifty dollars enough is a hundred dollars enough, so I think um, it's not necessarily the amount of the money it's the fact that she received it and it's it's not insignificant. Um, and I don't think your order has to say because she received $9,200, she's disqualified. I think if we go back to the 20,000 foot level, where's the, what's the appearance here? Is this fairness to the defendants? Um, is, does, it, does it appear that she is interested in this prosecution or does it appear that she's disinterested? She took the stand. You can tell she's not a disinterested person uh, when it comes to this proceeding. But we also argue she's not a disinterested person uh, when it comes to the prosecution as a whole. Um, it, I'm going to leave for, um, I'll resist the temptation uh, to defend my wife, um, and who I believe to be an excellent lawyer and a member of the bar for 20 years um, in good standing. But I will say this, Judge, you don't just evaluate the credibility of the witnesses. You evaluate the credibility of the lawyers. Um, and Mr. Abadi stood up here in open court in front of national news and in the national public and called her a liar. Um, I need to address that for one minute. Um, There's te text messages that are now part of the record, which now are substantive evidence for you to consider. Um, uh, prove everything that she put in that motion, everything that she tried to elicit um, from Mr. Bradley was absolutely 100% true. And no, not only was it true, she verified through the witness himself that the motion was accurate before it was filed. So for the state to get up here and impugn her credibility, um, it's not only improper, it violates Berger versus the United States, which is a case that says the state can't just get up here and make any argument it wants. And I encourage the court to call him out on it when he, when he steps up here. You, we have to have candor towards the tribunal. You cannot lie to the court, cannot lie to the public, cannot lie to the jury. And I think that's what he did. So there's other corroboration uh, of our view that uh, she, she was in this relationship. I, I think Frankly, based on Mr. Bradley's testimony, Your Honor can separate the wheat from the chaff when it comes to credibility, but he, Mr. Bradley had two chances um, to correct information that he suddenly developed amnesia about, uh, but and he just didn't do it. Um, How does the timing of the relationship impact financial interest? Because it's part of the scheme she created intentionally um, in order to give benefits to her boyfriend. So they had, there's a reason why they fought so hard on this judge. I mean, there's a, reason, there's a reason that every single subpoena was objected to. Every single question we asked Mr. Bradley was objected to. Uh, jumping up and down, all of, the, all of the obfuscation. There's a reason for that. They know that if Your Honor finds that that relationship started in 2019, that the appointment of Wade itself was improper. And if that was improper, then he had no business as an average citizen uh, along with the fact that he didn't have approval from, they didn't have approval from Fulton County to appoint him in the first place, that undermines the indictment, it creates a structural impairment in the indictment. Because um, he, he had no more business being in the, in the grand jury room than, than I did. Um, so that's what they're worried about. And the reason why it's important for the financial peace judge is it's how the money ended up going back to her. She put her boyfriend in the spot, paid him, and then reaped the benefits from it. Um, that she created the system and then didn't tell anybody about it. Um, she didn't even tell her dad about it. So I think if, in the grand scheme of things, if you're looking at the totality of the facts, um, it, and I've got to sit down here, about two minutes to make room for my co-counsel. Uh, if you look at it, everything put together, judges, they tried, they did this, they knew it was wrong, they hit it, and they didn't, they, even when they were called out on it, they tried to create an excuse for it by saying it happened after the fact. Um, we know now from the testimony, Ms. Yerdy confirmed uh, that Mr. Bradley, uh, his text messages were accurate, not his, not his <coughs> testimony, but, uh, but he, that, 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 that fact was accurate. The motion is accurate. And so um, uh, also I, I do want to point out um, there's no paper trail here uh, for the cash. Um, I know that this was a, I know she, she and her father both testified um, both testified that they kept cash on hand, um, which, I mean, 
keeping cash on hand in, its, in and of itself is not a problem. When you're a public official and you're required to keep track of gifts that you receive, uh, then you need to keep track of it. But there's no paper trail. There's no deposit history. There's no withdrawal history. There's no receipts. None of that. So even, even assuming their testimony could be credible, and, and we don't think that it is, you still don't have enough information to, to keep to track all that money that she received. And this is just but, what but we know But does the lack of evidence fall on the state? Is, isn't that, isn't this, is, does the lack of evidence fall on the state? Isn't, isn't that where burdens come in? Yet, it, 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 yes, I think they had an obligation to tell Your Honor, hey, this is where the money went. And they certainly had the ability to do that if they could do it. Since they didn't do it, we have to assume they can't. And if they can't, uh, I just want to remind the court of a very important piece of testimony from Ms. Willis um, that I think goes to credibility of all of the uh, officers of the court who testified. She met with Wade, and they developed in 10 minutes after talking about the financial piece, I believe, this cash theory um, that could not be rebutted. We have no ability to do that. Um, they did, um, and they chose not to do it. Um, so with that, Your Honor, unless Your Honor has more questions for me, I'm going to sit down and turn uh, the podium over uh, to my distinguished colleague, um, Mr. Sadow. Thank you, Mr. Merchant. Appreciate the court's time.